More than 4 billion people live across this vast continent called Asia. And we are telling their stories. On this edition, swimming with a gentle giant. Whale shark tourism is booming in the Philippines. But is it doing more harm than good to the world's largest fish? This is even worse if it's a wild animal because they're not used to interacting with humans, for example, because they're wild. It's once you have stress, you're more, your immune system plummets. And back in the wild, a look at efforts to save Indonesia's orangutans from poaching and the loss of their habitat. I'm Barnaby Below, and this is the Simon Asia. Welcome to the program. On today's show, we'll take you to the seas of the Philippines and the forests of Indonesia to highlight issues concerning the region's fragile wildlife. Whale shark tourism is a growing industry here in the Philippines, attracting thousands of visitors and generating millions of dollars in income every year. But environmentalists say excessive interaction with humans and, in particular, the practice of feeding whale sharks are harming the endangered species. I traveled to Oslo and Donsol, two towns with different people, close encounters with the gentle giants of the sea. A meet and greet with the world's largest fish. Guaranteed when visiting Oslo in the central Philippines. No wonder tourists have been flocking to this once sleepy town. And you, whale sharks arrive just as tourists start screaming into the beach. It is quite the sight. Boats and people and giant sea creatures all floating and swimming and within each other's reach. I was within touching distance of whale sharks, locally known as Putanding. This is as close as you can get to whale sharks anywhere in the world. Locals here in Oslo assure that you can get a close encounter with whale sharks pretty much any time here. But there are rules. The first, no touching. Well, I didn't touch any of the whale sharks around me, but a few may have touched me. Tourists we spoke with said they thought so too. I, uh, I didn't uh, touch it, but it touched me oh. by the tail. There was two sharks encircling me, surrounding me, and I think one of them actually kicked me first. So I was kind of scared for a bit. Rule number two, you can't be within two meters of a whale or five meters of a whale shark's tail. But how when there are whale sharks swimming all around you? I think there's a four meter limit. You have to be away from the shark. Uh, there are some instances where I'm pretty sure I got within uh, like 50 centimeters. How so many whale sharks converge in these waters every day has been the subject of a debate. Oslo's former mayor, now Vice Mayor Ronald Guaren, the architect of the town's whale shark tourism program says whale sharks have been sighted in their waters for generations. You will be surprised why these big fish, you know, these gentle giants, come into our uh, as municipal waters, then you can ask why, why, why is it that uh, from the many municipal water, why is it all slow? So maybe because of uh, our good biodiversity underwater, uh, that's uh, the reason why this whale shark have been in our municipal, municipal waters uh, a long time ago. You're not 100% sure why so many whale sharks are actually... Well, uh, according to uh, initial reports, uh, we have a lot of uh, food underwater. Why uh, our municipal... Uh, why these whale sharks are in our municipal waters. But it's the food from underwater or from the surface. Environmentalists and scientists argue there wouldn't be a huge concentration of whale sharks so close to also shore if it weren't for tour guides feeding them. For what they do is actually provisioning, which would include uh, feeding, luring, attracting. Is there anything wrong with that? Physiologically, ecologically, biologically, behaviorally, yes. 
So the thing with animals, even domestic animals, even your pets, if they have the stressors, and this is even worse if it's a wild animal because they're not used to interacting with humans, for example, because they're wild, is once you have stress, you're more, your immune system plummets. Uh, so for example, anything that would stress an animal or change their intake of energy would affect them uh, physiologically. And anything that physiologically is not good for them will affect how they function. Dr. Yaptin Chai says because Oslo whale sharks now identify bulls with feeding, they're vulnerable to poachers. Feeding also contributes to the destruction of coral reefs, and the whale sharks may not be getting proper nutrition. So normally, a uh, whale shark would be feeding uh, the variety of species of plankton, small fish, uh, shrimps in the water. And in Oslo, for the certain period that they're doing the provisioning, it will be limited to one type of food. So imagine yourself eating a hamburger three times a day for <laughs> or twice a day, let's say. Vice Mayor Goren rejects this notion. We only give them a little natural food for them to appear in the surface. If you cannot, if you will not give them a little amount, they will not. They have been in our municipal waters since time, as I said, since time immemorial. And we only uh, have this operation to help our, uh, the people in Tanawan improve their life without exploiting our whale shark. Indeed, Oslo's tourism industry has grown leaps and bounds. Resorts, restaurants and shops are thriving. During the peak season, as many as 1,500 tourists visit the town each day. They contribute more than a million U.S. dollars to Oslo's income annually, a fraction of which goes to fishermen turned guides. Aiki Nakahid is one of the roughly 300 members of the cooperative that has benefited from Oslo's tourism boom. Um, sa bawat tiket ng mga turista na pumupunta sa amin, 30% sa municipal, uh, 10% sa barangay, and then 60% for, sa Tospa Association. Yun din ang, ang hati-hatiin namin, equally divided sa whole association. At punan namin ng ano, mga expenses sa bawat araw. For roughly 10 to 20 US dollars a ticket, money that goes to Aiki and his fellow guides isn't a millionaire's pot. But it's enough for a decent living. And for him to be able to build this house. Nangingisda kasi kami. Hindi sigurado na makabinta kami ng isda. Kaya sa ngayon, parang siguro kahit 300 ang perdi namin or kung, kung susuwertihin mga 500. Or, ano, araw-araw, sigurado na yun kaysa pangingisda. Sabi ng misis mo kanina, ano daw, uh, parang meron ka din daw sanang balak mag-abroad. Oo. Oh, noon, sir, ba balak ako nag-abroad noon kasi palagi ako nag-apply. Pero wala pa yung butanding. Wala pa yung butanding. Pero sa ngayon, ah, wala ko nang magbalak na mag-abroad kasi ah, nandito, may, may kahit kunting kita, mal la malapit din yung pamilya sa akin. Aiki says his goal is to make sure his children get the education they need to be successful in life. Kaya? Kaya siguro, sir. Siguro pa? Oh, siguro kasi ano din yung butanding thanks uh, God's gift na hindi natin alam kung lalayo na sila sa atin. That's despite his belief that their practices are sustainable. Ito naman kami yung nakadistrib. Habitat nila kasi ano, Kalahating araw lang ang nag, nagbigay ng pagkain. Ah, hindi naman namin sila kinukulong kung saan sila gusto pumupunta. Hayaan naman namin. Fisherman in Gonsol, another Philippine town whose waters are frequented by whale sharks, say they likewise benefited from tourism. But they say their practices in Gonsol are more sustainable for whale sharks than Oslo. Nang dahil dito, yung dalawang huwanak, nagtatapos na ng college. Actually, hindi lang ako maraming BIOs na ang mga anak na pag-aral sa college. 
BIO or Butanding Interaction Officers is what the fishermen turned whale shark watching guides in Donsol are called. Alan Amanse has been one since the ecotourism program started in 1998. So, ang sa inyo, para mas long term yung Mas long term yung sa amin. Uh, kasi hindi lang para sa amin, kasi tumatanda na kami mga BIOs. So yung mga kasunod namin, yung mga, mga anak namin, yun, dapat sila din naman ang pumalit sa amin. To find out exactly how they're doing it in Donso, Alan took us to what I can only describe as an adventure. Hey, good morning uh, to all of you. So, Before setting sail, he had a few reminders and instructions. The wells do not get in the water. Without my signal. Okay. And I'm gonna tell you to sit on this side of this boat. Okay. Wearing mask, fins, and a snorkel. Okay. And we'll sit on the side of this boat facing outside. Okay. And if I say okay, let's rock and roll, <laughs> that is the time to get in the water. We had three hours to search and swim with whale sharks. Yes, that's right. And like in Oslo, where whale sharks are close to the shore, we had to look for the ones in Donsol especially during the lean season. After about an hour of scouring the water, we saw both fulls of tourists in one area. We were told whale sharks had shown up there. But after waiting for half an hour, we didn't see any. And then, there it was. The people in the boat next to us were jumping into the water. So, as Alan would say, time to rock and roll. But the few minutes I was underwater, I could hardly see anything. I didn't see it. It was already too late when I went into the water, you know, for, uh, for the biggest fish in the world. It was moving quite fast. My guide was telling me it was under me but I didn't see it plus the water was murky but it was definitely still uh, a thrilling exciting experience well no one said we were definitely going to see whale sharks World Wildlife Fund or WWF which helped launch and now supervises the program says it's part of the deal ang kaibahan daw dito sa Donsol more uh, excitement yung nandito sa Donsol. Kasi nga, hindi mo makita. They're spotting the wild sharks. So, hindi mo makita kung nasan sila. But, when they are spotting the wild sharks, so, yun yung nagkakaroon ng parang excitement yung mga turista. It's a win-win approach. Everyone in Donsol seems to agree. WWF's forces says it's even had an impact on the town's fishing. Maraking bagay yung, ano eh, yung because of uh, uh, butanding or wild shark. Parang, uh, tumaas yung kamalayan ng tao in terms of managing their um, resources like the marine resources because they have now uh, the so called they call it um, marine protected area so they are maintaining this uh, marine protected area just to improve and uh, increase the productivity of the ocean or the marine resources the possible adverse effects of Oslo's practices may still be years in the making but this Dr. Yapin Chai knows for sure. The soil started out as a, as a conservation project to protect the sharks. But in Oslo, I think it's a different case because it started out more like a business than a conservation project. It is, to a certain extent, a matter of perspective. But in the end, there is only one ocean. So whatever happens in Oslo could be felt in the soil and elsewhere in time. With the global whale shark population declining by more than half over the last 75 years, various organizations have stepped up their efforts to protect the species. 
The World Wildlife Fund, for instance, is working with governments all over the world to develop and implement codes of conduct for tourists swimming with whale sharks. Coming up, saving and rehabilitating Indonesia's orangutans. Their name literally means person of the forest. Yet orangutans in Southeast Asia have lost their homes to deforestation over the years. And many have fallen prey to poachers. Faced with this challenge, a non-profit group in Indonesia has been saving the species and giving them refuge before releasing them into the wild. Silkina Aliwalia visited East Kalimantan on Borneo Island, where orangutans are having a new lease on life. In the heart of Borneo's forest, Heli is climbing her way up to freedom. She is one of six orangutans that were released to the KJ7 forest in East Kalimantan. It's Heli's first time to taste fresh forest air after more than 10 years in a rescue shelter. Before her release, Heli was rehabilitated at the Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation. The nonprofit organization has been rescuing orangutans since 1991. Di bos itu baik Kalimantan Timur dan Kalimantan Tengah kita punya hampir 700 dan kebanyakan mereka datang karena ada konflik dengan manusia. Kenapa terjadi konflik? Karena manusia membuka hutan untuk kepentingannya. Sehingga uh, orang hutan menjadi keluar dari rumahnya karena hutannya diambil oleh manusia. Dan ketika datang ke pusat rehabilitasi kita di BOSF, baik Nyaru Menteng maupun Samboja Lestari, tidak semuanya dalam kondisi sehat. Ada yang trauma. Most of the orangutans that Jamartin Seahite rescued suffered at the hands of illegal poachers and pet traders. And it takes years for them to readapt to a life of freedom. Jamartin provides more than just shelter at his sanctuary. Orangutans as young as three are enrolled in forest school, where they spend years learning skills to survive in the jungle. Caretaker Agus Irwanto says it's a challenging process. For up to 12 years, instructors train young orangutans to climb trees, build nests, and forage for edible fruits in the wild. Kendalanya adalah setiap orangutan itu datang individual. Jadi harus dinilai bahwa oh si A ini butuhnya ternyata A, si B ini ternyata butuhnya bukan B, tapi A itu harus ini. terus uh, kendala utamanya lagi adalah memulangkan mereka itu membutuhkan hutan yang harus aman atau secure untuk misalnya 60 tahun ke depan, itu yang susah. Borneo's incredibly rich rainforests are home to thousands of species of plants, primates, and birds that cannot be found anywhere else. Orangutans are able to thrive only where there's enough natural food sources. But the island's pristine forests are going through drastic change. The Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation has released its 200th orangutan to the wild in 2017. But finding suitable untouched forests for future releases is becoming more complicated. Indonesia is one of the world's largest greenhouse gas emitters, and most of its pollution comes from deforestation. Here in Borneo, rainforests are being cut down to make way for industrial plantations. Millions of hectares of land have been burned down in the past decade. It has gotten so severe that many environmentalists are already predicting the end of Borneo's lush greenery. Large hectares of those lands are converted for logging and agriculture, such as palm oil production. 
Bank. The industry is essential to Indonesia's economy, worth more than six billion U.S. dollars, and employing nearly four million people across the country. But the negative environmental impact remains. Deforestation is one of the leading contributors to climate change in Indonesia. Borneo has lost 30 percent of its forest cover in the past 40 years. Sekarang itu areal hutan kita makin kurang karena perusahaan perubahan tata guna hutan membuat hutan itu menjadi bisa dikonversi menjadi uh, penggunaan lain. Yang kami mau katakan adalah hutan dimanapun dia harusnya hutan. The challenge to save Indonesia's orangutans has reached a critical stage. The International Union for Conservation of Nature recently declared orangutans a critically endangered species. That's after 80 percent of their homes were destroyed in the massive forest fires of 2015 in central Kalimantan. But orangutans are not the only ones threatened by destruction. Orang hutan itu punya peran ekologi di habitatnya yang sangat penting gitu ya. Dia dia kan berperan sebagai seed dispersal karena makanan utamanya adalah buah-buahan di hutan gitu ya. Jadi cukup banyak jumlahnya ratusan jenis pohon yang dimakan orang hutan. Dengan e, sebagai pemakan biji kan dia jadi e, berperan sebagai penyebar biji kan. The battle between corporate groups and environmental campaigners seems never ending. But the Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation is beginning to take small steps to make big changes, eager to prove that both sides can coexist. Early in 2017, they partnered with a palm oil company to acquire some of their protected lands where they intend to release orangutans. Kami harusnya adalah pusat rehab terkecil di dunia. Sekarang, kami adalah pusat rehab terbesar di dunia. Harapan kami dari BOSF adalah satu hari nanti kami tidak punya orang hutan di pusat rehab. Tapi kami mengurus orang hutan di hutan seperti ini. John Martin continues to strive to provide a second chance at life for these orangutans. A second chance now enjoyed by Heli, who's on her way to becoming an independent orangutan back home in the wild. For Assignment Asia, I'm Salkina Aluwalia in Borneo, East Kalimantan, Indonesia. The Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation aims to release 150 orangutans within 2017. But as deforestation remains a huge problem, experts believe that beyond rehabilitating the species, there should be greater focus on protecting and preserving their natural habitat. You can learn more about this and all the stories on today's program on our website, www.assignment-asia.com. That's all the time we have for this week. I'm Barnaby Lowe. Thanks for watching and join us again on Assignment Asia.